Hello, York Sports Network fans. Welcome back to a brand new medium for us here uh, on York Sports Network. We used to do this all the time back during COVID, but we are doing a playoff preview show today for you guys because unfortunately for us and unfortunately for you guys at home, the stream will not be on York Sports Network. The York vs. Oswego East 8A Round 1 playoff game will be streaming on NFHS Network, which you can find just by looking it up, and it is behind a paywall. Pretty sure it's $12 to $15 per month, I want to say, around there. Um, so if you would like to pay and you really want to see this game and you're really not, a, not able to go, that would be the way you would watch it. We are going to try and live tweet it, um, and that will be... Depending on how many drives I remember to live tweet, but I will try my best during the game uh, to get the info out to you guys. So if you follow us at our Twitter, which is York underscore network on Twitter, if you follow us there, you will get live updates of the game as fast as possible. You'll definitely get scoring updates, um, and I'll try and give a little more detail so you don't miss out too much if you're unable to pay for the stream. And that'll be happening for the rest of the playoffs. And speaking of the rest of the playoffs, the wonderful amazing Gavin Connolly, play-by-play -play announcer for York Sports Network, is going to give us a little preview on what the playoffs look like this year and what the Duke's path is looking to be. So yeah, obviously the game that everyone cares about is the York Dukes versus the Oswego East Wolfpack. Dukes coming into the playoffs ranked as the second seed, which I believe is the highest in program history. First time ever winning nine games, second time ever going undefeated. Um, Comparing them to Oswego East, they kind of snuck in with a five and four record. Um, they're they're gonna be the thirty first seed, obviously. So yeah, five and four record record in the uh, Southwest Prairie Conference, which you know, not the not the hardest of competition there. Not like the West Suburban Silver, uh, especially not for Oswego East. They had three playoff opponents, but they lost all three. A lot of their wins just came from kind of beating up on their. Uh, lowly teams in the conference, They're like teams like Oswego, teams like Plainfield East, um, whereas you compare that to York, you know, 9-0 and obviously, first in the West Suburban Silver, they had four playoff opponents, instead of going 0-3, they went 4-0, and so obviously a bit of a strength of schedule difference there, um, another stat to note, opponent win percentage for Oswego East, 40.7% compared to 53.1%. Or York, and then obviously the big top ten victory against Glumbard West. Oswego East does not have that to their resume, so I feel like this definitely favors the Dukes, as one can infer, just because you know the Dukes can play in these big games and can play against any level of competition. Definitely, yeah, and you you see that a lot with definitely, yeah, you see that a lot with um, as you said the strength of schedule. Um, as well as the, just the competitiveness overall, is there was multiple times where uh, Oswego East faced a team of the Dukes caliber as if the final game of the year, which was against another undefeated team, and that was Plainfield North, I want to say. And Plainfield North undefeated, they whomped them 35 nothing. But as you said, that strength of schedule and all of that matters in terms of judging a team, but it is the playoffs. And as the saying goes, everyone starts at 0-0, zero, zero, and you got to win the team that's in front of you, and that is Oswego East, which is by no means a bad team. I, you know, They're in the playoffs, they're 5-4 for a reason, and they're led by their Navy commit. Um, Trey Jones. Trey Jones, Navy commit, commit quarterback. So they are not a shabby team, and this is one of those games where the Dukes are going to need to contain Trey Jones. And... You know, how would the Dukes go about doing that? And, you know, what about Trey Jones makes him able to be a high-level D1 commit at, at the Naval Academy? So, yeah, I was just going to kind of talk about the offense, uh, Oswego East offense and how they compare to the York defense, kind of as a whole, because you'll, the, the theme with Oswego East is they have a lot of stars at uh, one position, but the depth just really isn't there the way that the Dukes have it. So, like you said, Trey Jones, an amazing dual-threat quarterback, uh, committed to Navy, 6'3", 180, so, you know, pretty good size. They also have a running back, or a fullback, that plays uh, as a middle linebacker as well, Oshobi Odior, who's huge, <laughs> and, he and just can run. And he just committed to Eastern Illinois, sorry, Western Illinois University. 
So, yeah, so immediately two guys who are playing at the next level right there. But the reason that I'm still confident about this is that the Dukes, given their tough schedule, they have the experience against athletic quarterbacks, you know. I'm uh, talking to some kids with us. We go easily compare Trey Jones to, like, a Lamar Jackson, which, I mean, if you think about that, seems like a really hard player to contain. But then you could look back and you think that the Dukes have played their fair share of athletic quarterbacks as well, like Ryan Jackson from LT and Corey Ty from Glenbard West. The Dukes were, you know, they definitely gave up their share of big plays like anybody would. But for the most part, they were able to contain them and kind of, they ran multiple like spy packages with a like a middle linebacker like Jacob Young type to just kind of like stare down the quarterback and just kind of read his every move when he scrambles in the pocket and just sort of uh, overall just contain them and minimize their uh, running ability as much as they could. So I mean, like I said, Trey Jones is an amazing player, but I still feel confident with this Duke with the Duke scheme. And just the, sort of their depth and talent overall, I feel comfortable that they'll be able to contain him. Definitely. As you said with the scheme, that's what I love about Coach Fitz's preparation is that, you know, he knows that the Dukes, being in Illinois high school football, you're not going to face the Bama quarterback, the future Bama quarterback. You're not going to face a future Tennessee quarterback like a Hendon Hooker or something like that. You are going to be facing let's say, lackluster quarterback talent throughout the course of Illinois. Illinois' you know, high school football teams have always been more defensive and running game, uh, you know, hard-nosed football, and that's why I love about the scheme with the three down linemen and five linebackers that gives you that versatility. Obviously, the Dukes run uh, a line up with two linebackers up at the line of scrimmage, so it's two edges and then three back, three in the middle. So it's a big, heavy package, and the ranginess of all six or seven rotational linebackers is really helpful because you can throw any of them against a tight end or a slot receiver, and they will definitely not just survive but also thrive in that position, which really gives them an opportunity to let the ranginess of Matt Sutter in the back end really work out well and keep a cap on the offense, which is what they're going to need to do. Is They're going to need to make sure they contain um, they're going to make sure that they need to contain um, Trey Jones's deep balls, as he has a very good deep ball, as well as uh, his running ability to break out those big plays and keep them 10 yards and in and make them dink and dunk their way down the field because these aren't professional quarterbacks who have the patience to dink and dunk their way down the field. They're going to try things, and if you keep forcing them into long third downs, which is the key in high school football, is long third downs. You keep your long third downs to a minimum, and you make their third, third down and longs maximum. And that's the way you win, and that's the way the Dukes are going to need to perform that night, or tonight. Yeah, and just going back to what you said about the deep ball, I do feel like that's pretty important, just because at the high school football level, when you see teams go down like two scores, you know, a lot of the teams don't have the vertical passing attack to really get scores like quickly. Um, but when you add that element of having a um, the ability to throw the ball down the field pretty accurately, it allows you to score in a hurry and cut into those deficits pretty fast. So the Dukes will definitely have to like stay disciplined and um, keep a top on the defense for sure. Uh, as for wide receivers, there weren't really any notable names. I don't think you had any either. No, that was actually one of the major weaknesses of Oswego East is the fact that it's a very top-heavy offense with the with the backfield being um, outweighing the rest as the rest of the guys there are you know it's a playoff team they're still good but they are just not star talents as um, Trey Jones and I don't want to butcher his, his name so I'll let oh, you show me Odior that's Shobie a matchup Odior. that's a matchup that I fear a little bit more just because the sheer size and combination of size and talent I mean, this is a fullback that's 6'2", 236, and it's just kind of like when you pair that up with the Dukes defense, the Dukes don't have an individual, like a nose tackle or a defensive end or anything that has the size to just match up with them and take him down on his own. So it's going to be a lot of, a lot more pressure on the front four to kind of win the battle with the offensive line. I think they can do that to just not allow any gaps in the A gap or the B gaps just because he can plow through and get the ball forward, and he's one of those guys that, I mean, last year he wasn't remarkably efficient, only about like four yards of carry, but this year he's very much better. He's one of those guys where it's like you think you have him, but then he uses the lower body strength and a little bit of a push from the offensive line, he can pick up another four yards, which 
in a game where every drive matters, every first down matters, you know, that's pretty significant over the course of the game. Definitely. And, you know, so a little worried about that Oswego East offense. Okay. They've been very consistent, all inconsistent yeah, all year as their away games. Uh, they have not been nearly as good with their away games, which would be the other um, aspect of this, is that the Dukes are home and Oswego East is on the road, and they have an average of 13.25 points per game on the road. So less than two touchdowns per game on the road. And that's just, you know, they're going to have to convert when they need to, and it's playoff time, they're going to need to step up as they've been averaging around 31 points per game at home. So we shall see if Oswego East is able to step it up. But moving on to the Dukes offense, led by their star quarterback, Matt Veza, who completed six, roughly 65% of his passes for nearly 1,600 yards and 19 touchdowns this year. And the best part about Matt Veza is his running attribute, 53 carries, 324 yards, which results in 6.1 yards per carry and two touchdowns. How can Matt Veza and the rest of the stellar Dukes offense Matt, how do they match up to Oswego East, and how can they compete well and really separate the Dukes from this Wolfpack team? Well, again, I just think it kind of comes down to the depth that the Dukes have and just sort of like their preparation. You know, like we've seen so many times, whether it's injuries or a um, specific example, we'll go Glenbard West when, you know, you have the uh, four-star safety Joey Pope and another cornerback double-teaming Charlie Speck. You have the, the, the preparation for uh, younger guys, or I guess, less targeted guys like Luke Mayland or Brian Pelosa to step up and make all the big catches that Speck normally would have. You know, so just sort of the ability to have so many playmakers that when you put a star cornerback to take away a guy like Speck, then you have a big game from Mayland. You know, so it's not it's it's really just kind of like punch for punch and the Dukes will never run out of punches, it seems like. So I would just say stick to their game plan offensively and just kinda like have the trust that you you know, we I would say have the trust in your guys, but we know that you can trust them. You know, they've played and had so many big games on big stages already. So, got, uh, even like underclassmen like Mayland or Velia, you know, Mancini has had his uh, his best game was Hinsdale Central. Having having those guys have the ball in their hands, you know, we feel comfortable with that with some of the stars like Odie Orr because he's a middle linebacker. If he takes away. Uh, playmakers, like I mentioned, you know, obviously the first first options are Watson and Speck. You have other guys to step up. Definitely, yeah. And um, as you said, there's just so much depth at that wide receiver position. Uh, Charlie Speck had a wonderful year. He had nine touchdowns, and he's really the big play threat. And as you said, that's probably going to be the key is that they had double teamed Charlie Speck. That's how you know they were so good. This is a this is a top ten team in state, and they were like. We need to stop Charlie Speck, and they weren't able to as he had a 43 or 46 yard touchdown reception on Glenbard West to give the Dukes the lead and was eventually the game winning touchdown. This great running offense that the Dukes have with Kelly Watson, who this year had nearly six yards per carry, 87. 87 carries for 507 yards, and then you had Jake Mellion who stood out a couple of games. On, and behind that you have a man who won Team of the Week from Friday Night Drive in Adam Fennell, the one week where he really got in. He had, uh, I want to say like <clears throat> 26 carries yeah, for it was like 125 yards carries or something. And three touchdowns. So he really had a great game. So the depth on the Dukes offense is really what sets them apart from a lot of teams and makes them viable for a state championship this year, but of course you have to win the first game at the beginning to really get your momentum going and start on the playoffs. So thank you all for joining us, uh, or real quick, uh, the winner, if the Dukes go on to win, and if the Dukes go on to win, they will play the winner of Naperville North and Marist. Marist is playing at Naperville North, so if Marist wins next week, it will be at Marist, but if Naperville North, Naperville North will travel to West Elmhurst here and play the Dukes at Clarence D. East Field. But as we said, first the Dukes got to win this game. It's not going to be a simple walk through. It's not going to be a 50 point blowout. Probably we shall see. But thank you all for joining us. We do apologize for the inconvenience of us not being able to stream. Trust us, we would love to stream this game. But catch us on Twitter with live updates. 
at York underscore network. Please like, subscribe, and as I always say, if you have nothing nice to say, don't say it at all. Leave nice comments down below. Thank you for joining us. Go Dukes!